I am a sucker for a good parade. How about any of y'all? Someone who lists uh, people watching is maybe one of my favorite pastimes. A parade is rife with eclectic collection of unique and colorful souls from throughout this community gathering together for fun and simple entertainment. The 4th of July and Christmas parades are quite popular here in Stanton, in fact. Within a week of my arrival last summer, back in July, I made my way down to Gypsy Hill Park for my first gathered experience of the Stanton community. There were marching bands, local social clubs, church groups, politicians, and businesses all taking part in the festivities. I saw plenty of dogs, even horses, and... Was that Jesus just driving by in a Jeep? (laughs) Now, logic would tell us that parades don't make a ton of sense. Why do we gather to cheer on these groups in the first place? In any other circumstance, would it be appropriate to yell and scream at your local city council member in hopes of them throwing back at you little Debbie's brownies on the way? And yet there we are. Some of us arrive ridiculously early to reserve the the good spots. We don't want to miss out on any of that action. We, We gather with friends and family to cheer on those we know personally, as well as those we may not know. And at the end of the day, after hours of sitting in the sun or in the winter cold, All we may have for our efforts is maybe a handful of pamphlets and coupons and advertisements. Or if we're lucky, a can of Dr. Pepper. And also, within the same breath, we will share with one another how great this parade was and how much fun we had and how we can't wait to do it all over again next year. We remember parades of old here at First Presbyterian as well. We may remember uh, Palm Sundays from years previous, when the church had all sorts of kids gathered with their palms as they would process up and down the aisles while festive music played and the at-capacity congregation was all singing together. And also as anxious parents watch their children waving those palms to and fro, praying that they would behave appropriately and not become the talking point for years to come. Remembering when your kid did that? Nowadays, that's more the exception than the rule at many of our traditional churches. Where did the children go? Where did the parents of the children go? Where the crowds that used to fill these pews go? In particular with this congregation, we're left with understandable questions and doubts about the future of First Presbyterian. We know that there is a Presbyterian process for doing things decently and in order, but even so, we have our reservations. I'll be honest with you, even as many of you here in this place have welcomed me as your interim pastor with smiles and enthusiasm, I've also sensed some sadness and anger and fear behind those very same smiles. And this is all very understandable. After all, the church has been through quite a lot these past few years. Some of us want to leave the past behind and move courageously and bravely forward. Others of us are still maybe processing all that has taken place. All of us are seeking to figure out our roles to play in the days and years ahead. 
Now, today marks the sixth and final message on our theme of transformation through discipleship. As we have navigated this Lenten journey together with Jesus, and, and now we arrive at this festive Palm Sunday. Or was it? Today's story is also a reflection on transition, a, a theme that we all can relate to as maybe as Jesus and his disciples enter Jerusalem and with it what we as Christians call the beginning of this holy week. Like those of us experiencing the variety of emotions and processes that take place within this transitional ministry here at First Presbyterian, Jesus and his disciples also experience complex realities in the days ahead. Days that will transform the very foundations of who they are as they move forward in faith. You see, you and me, we're not very different than those disciples back then, are we? Each of us seeking to live our best lives as followers of Jesus. Each of us living with complex realities within this world. Each of us seeking purpose and meaning and salvation. So let's dive into the story once again. It's a, a familiar story. Maybe we can each tell it to one another as we continue on our journey with Jesus to the cross and to that empty tomb as told through the lens of Mark this morning. So again, we're, we're reading from Mark chapter 11. As previously mentioned, this chapter is a, a new act in the narrative that's unfolding as Jesus now enters a scene in Jerusalem. There he will confront the religious authorities and teach his disciples about the cost of following him once again as he sets into motion the passion narrative of, of what we know as Holy Week. And so many of us have heard this story before, perhaps with some variations. We, we see this story portrayed throughout the different Gospels as told. And even last Tuesday in our Bible study, we looked at these different details and, and how they may be similar or how they may be different according to Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And this, however, uh, reminds us that even though there are some differences, the, the general gist of the story is, is the same. And so Jesus gives the disciples instructions on finding an, an unwritten colt or a donkey. The disciples and his followers will, will help create a processional by laying cloaks and branches in front of his path with shouts reminiscent of these ancient psalms of praise that we've already read this morning. And, and Jesus will enter the great city not as a conquering military hero per se, but, but rather as a humble peacemaker. The details and prophetic imagery that both Jesus and the disciples incorporate is, is quite fascinating within this text. But what I'm most intrigued about as we retell this story is how each of us, as readers of this familiar narrative, may interpret such a story for us today. Again, we read from... Uh, Mark uh, chapter 11, verse 8. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields and those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. I wonder, where do each of you see yourselves in this unfolding narrative are you laying cloaks on the road up ahead are you shouting hosanna or maybe are you keeping a distance quietly taking in all that's taking place trying to make sense of this figure whom they call the messiah and what do we imagine the city was like on that day was this processional the, the main event happening in Jerusalem? Or was this demonstration one of the, just a multitude of things happening in an otherwise very busy city with multiple gates to enter? 
What does it mean to have Jesus arrive in this way? Was what Jesus and the disciples did was, was that a parade? Some of us may imagine it in this way. There were no fire trucks, no one passing out candy that I know of. Well, we did have a live animal. And you can choose to agree or disagree, but, but at least within our author Mark's portrayal of this particular story, I like to think of what Jesus and the disciples did was, was more akin, perhaps, to street theater. More of a, a public demonstration than a parade. And yes, I can imagine joy and smiles and excitement. I mean, I can also imagine perhaps a hint of protest from this man riding on a donkey, surrounded by his followers entering these city gates. And dare I say, maybe a hint of sadness from Jesus as well, as his role and his future was now coming into realization. And he continues forward nonetheless. This is a moment where Jesus knew the repercussions of their actions on that day, and still he persisted. He trusted in God's calling. He followed the leading of that same Holy Spirit. Jesus trusted the process. And we have been there before, haven't we? We know what it's like to be holding those same complex emotions within us while putting up a strong front for others around us. We know what it's like to not fully understand how things might turn out in this world, but we persist in trust and faith. Jesus knows what we have been through as well. Jesus understands the the consequences that we face when seeking to follow him. But he also knows the liberation on the other side of this journey. And so he invites us today to trust in his plans. Jesus says, walk beside me as we enter these gates. Follow me as we make our way to the cross. Yes, a life of discipleship is challenging at times, but it is also transformative. Yes, you will lose your life, and you will be reborn in the Spirit. Friends, the good news today is that Jesus invites us to trust the process of transformation in discipleship, to give in to God's plans for our lives in this world as we journey in discipleship to the cross of Good Friday and as we ultimately experience salvation at the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. And today... Well, we have a parade to attend to, or a demonstration, or however you like to picture it. We will wave palms, we will shout aloud and process forward with smiles and joy. And in so doing, we will defy the authorities who say that this world must be one particular way. We will protest the limits of an earthly kingdom as we beckon a new heavenly kingdom. We will trust the process of God's plans in our lives, putting our faith in the Prince of Peace who rides upon a colt, who brings not only peace, but love and grace and salvation for all. 
for this, we give thanks and praise. Amen.